Well, turn with me in your Bibles to the New Testament, to the letter of Paul to the Philippians. As we continue working our way through this book, Philippians chapter 2, and we'll read this chapter again. It's on page 1179. Philippians 2, the last time we looked at verses 1 to 11. So we shall move on to the next verses. But let us read this whole, whole chapter together. Philippians 2 and verse 1. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility, consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, been made in human likeness, and been found in the appearance of a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Do everything without complaining or arguing, so that you may become blameless and pure children of God, without fault in a crooked and depraved generation, in which you shine like stars in the universe, as you hold out the word of life, in order that I may boast on the day of Christ, that I did not run or labor for nothing. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you, so you too should be glad and rejoice with me. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I, may also, that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who takes a genuine interest in your welfare. For everyone looks out for his own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself, because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope therefore to send him as soon as I see how things go with me. And I am confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. But I think it is necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. For he longs for all of you, and is distressed because you heard he was ill. Indeed he was ill, and almost died, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but also on me, to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore I am all the more eager to send him, so that when you see him again, you may be glad, and I may have less anxiety. Welcome him in the Lord with great joy, and honour men like him, because he almost died for the work of Christ, risking his life to make up for the help you could not give me. Amen. Let me pray the Lord God is blessing to his word. Well, turn with me in your Bibles again to Philippians chapter 2. <clears throat> I want us to focus uh, this morning on just two verses. 
Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12 and verse 13. Let us read these verses together. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Uh, maybe you can recall, uh, or perhaps you've erased it from your memory, nights in your home around the Scrabble board. Uh, I know games like this, they can get heated. And then I'm sure there's, there's usually one person in the household who's known to the rest as the cheater. But I want to begin by naming and explaining three words which would be match winners in a game of Scrabble, but are perhaps a little unfamiliar to us, if we have not had them explained to us before. There are words that we just spout out from the pulpit, and perhaps it's taken for granted that we know what they mean. So let me just share these three words with you. They all have to do with our salvation, our being saved, our being brought from death to life. The first word is justification. Justification means that we are saved, justified, in that very moment of conversion. It means we are set free. It means we have been saved from the penalty of sin. The second word is sanctification. And that's an even bigger word. It's the word we're going to focus on this morning. Sanctification is, what, uh, is this ongoing process throughout the entirety of a Christian's life. Sanctification is where we are being saved from the power of sin. And the third word is glorification. And glorification is in the future. And we, it is when we will be saved from the presence of sin. And at our glorification we shall enter into our eternal home. Into heaven. And there... There shall be no more sin. So justification is when we have been saved, been saved from the penalty of sin. Sanctification is when we are being saved from the power of sin. And glorification is when we will be saved from the presence of sin. I want to uh, focus this morning on what it means to be a Christian. Some here today have been Christians for many years, others for a few months, and some of you are questioning if you will commit to Jesus Christ and become a Christian. Our text today enables us to zoom in on the Christian life and analyse what does a Christian do or what should a Christian do? Last week Alistair was telling me that in the Sunday evening sermon he was telling you that he took out a gym membership. And so he got shown around all of the facilities and how to use the equipment. But he has never ventured in to the gym. And he is not going to feel any benefit from that gym or from that membership he has if he never goes and works out. But far more importantly, what is the point of receiving your spiritual induction if you are never going to engage and work out your salvation? We all need to look at ourselves in the mirror and ask, am I growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ? This is serious business. Before we launch in though, I need to be clear. Paul is not exhorting random hearers here to work out their salvation. In other words, he's not just coming up to a random group of people and saying, do this and you'll be saved. No, he calls them in verse 12, my dear friends, 
are my beloved. These are Christians he is talking to. They are believers already. And Paul was the one who planted this church in Philippi. And he has a deep spiritual concern for them. He never uses this greeting without referring to believers. The Christian is called, uh, is called to work out their salvation with fear and trembling. So in verse 12 and in verse 13, Paul explains both the heads and the tails of the same coin. And I want us to focus on these two verses, which are so, so very important. I want to tackle verse 13 first, and more briefly, to begin with, before we zoom in on verse 12. So we'll look at God's part in verse 13. And our part in verse 12. So we begin with God's part. Because without God's part. Without verse 13. Our part in verse 12. Would be a frightening read. Verse 12 would send terror through our bones. Because we would only read Paul saying. Work out your own salvation. On your own. With no help from anybody else. No intervention from the Lord. But by the grace of God. We do have verse 13. And it gives us so much assurance. And it gives the believer so much hope. Our duty is to work out what God has already worked in. It is God who works in you. And he is always working. We may have the mindset that God is just sitting on his throne somewhere above watching over us. Watching everything we're doing and everything, the chaos that is going on down below. But no, God the Father takes a vested interest in the life of every Christian. He is not passive. Rather he is working. And the Greek word for work. Which we will see again in verse 12. It, it can mean energy. He has invested energy. He has invested effort. Into your life. As a Christian. It is like the farmer who, who goes out to prepare the soil as best as he can. So that the ground is good and it is healthy. And so it may bear the reward of growth. God is cultivating your heart as a Christian. Desiring to see growth in there. Excited to observe that you move on from your spiritual infancy. And on to maturity. It is God who works in you to will. And to act. That is what we read in verse 13. It is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose or his good pleasure. God is the cause. And we are the effect. While well, God has called us to work out our own salvation. He does not leave us to our own resources. No, he has granted us. The desire, he has granted us intentions necessary so that we may grow in all God has accomplished for us in Christ. He has worked in us. The only reason that the Christian can even attempt to do any of this good is because God has already worked in us. It is because of what God has already done. He is working in you. And that means even this morning. Even this moment. Our God is at work. Cultivating your heart. He will not rest until he observes the change. Until you are made like his son. Jesus Christ. 
until you are made like him. Until your will and your desires mirror the will and desires of your saviour. And if you do not have God working in you, then you do not have the power. It is like having a brand new computer which is so slick, it's so shiny, it's so fast. But if it's not connected to the power source, then it's useless. The so-called Christian without God doesn't exist. So let me be clear, this is not a message calling you Christian, you must do better. No, we need to cry out to God to change our desires. That when the moment of testing comes, we desire obedience to Him more than that sin that tempts us. It is God who is working in you to bring about that change. This is God's part. And as we will see in a moment, we have a significant role to play as well. But just the final thing in this verse, in verse 13. God does all of this ultimately for his good purpose, for his good pleasure. He does it because he wants to. He loves holiness and he hates, he hates sin. And as you desire to change, as, and as your desires change, as they begin to match his desires, our character will, will then, it shall reflect the glory of God. So if God is not working in you, if you are not aware of his molding and his shaping in your life, then you need to do some serious soul searching. What faith is it that you think you have? This is God's part. And without it, we would have no part. You can only work out your salvation if God has worked salvation into you. So secondly, and in more uh, detail, we focus on our part. But within this point I want to give you three sub points just so you can follow me through uh, this section. The Christian is to be three things. He is to be obedient. He is to be at work. And he is to be in awe. We see that in verse 12. To be obedient at work and in awe. So we return to that verse, to verse 12. Let us read it just for our... Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Paul is exhorting the church to be obedient when he is with them, but more so when he is not with them. Their faith cannot depend on his presence among them. He would love to be among them. To share and to teach them more. But they have to learn not to lean partially on Paul. And partially on Christ. And you and I need to learn. We don't lean partially on the minister. Or on world famous preachers. Or on other Christians. And partially on Christ. No we lean and depend only on Jesus Christ. How pitiful our faith would be if we only act like Christians when we come to church. Or when we are around other Christians. We all know that your children, all of our children, they're on their best behaviour when the adult is in the room. Or even you as a driver, you keep every speed limit when the police car Is in your rear view mirror. But the Christian does not. And cannot operate in that way. Preachers or other Christians are not essential to your new life. 
as a Christian, your spiritual life is dependent on your obedience. Your obedience to God's word, which you have been taught week after week. Obedience is essential to the Christian walk. And I can illustrate it best by describing the alternative. Nothing hinders or pulls a handbrake up on your Christian life more than disobedience. When you choose to ignore God's instructions. And you go off and do your own sinful desires. We must be obedient. And it is essential for at least one reason that we find in this immediate context. In chapter 2 verse 8. And being found in appearance as as a man. He humbled himself. Becoming obedient to death. Even death on a cross. Obedience is essential for our development to become more like Jesus Christ. If Jesus was obedient to the point of death. So that he may wipe away your sin. And so that you may inherit salvation. Can we not also be obedient To the word of God. So that we may grow. In our Christ likeness. The Christian is to be obedient. But the Christian is also to be at work. Paul calls the Philippians. To work out their salvation. Just as God is not passive. Nor are you to be passive. No Christian. Sits in the passenger seat. But instead he is to have both feet on the ground. Marching into the battle against your own sin. I cannot emphasize enough. Paul does not say work for your salvation. But he says work out your salvation. Nobody has ever managed to work for their salvation. No amount of good deeds. Or good works will be credited to your spiritual bank account. Martin Luther writes. Good works do not make a good man. But a good man does make good works. So we must work out everything. Which God has worked in. God has placed in you a desire. A will. A knowledge of what is good and a knowledge of what is wrong. A love for not only himself, but a love for other people. A hatred for sin and a passion for the lost and so much more. He has worked all of that in us. And so we must work all of that out of us. Some will choose in the Christian life. They'll choose to sit back. They will think that all that effort is too much for them. And so they will be content with their being saved. And from then on they shall do no more than the bare minimum. Well not one soul who has taken that approach has progressed in their Christian walk with Christ. They will be as immature today as they were on the day. They were converted. We must work out what God has worked in. Allow me to give you two technical terms um, for this phrase, work out. It's actually just one word in, in the Greek. And it is in the present tense. And it is in the imperative. What does that matter? It's in the present tense, he says, work out. That means... It has value because you are meant to be doing this today. In the here and now. Working out your salvation. There is no day off in the kingdom. There is no retirement for the saints. And going on holiday. It may be a break from your usual routines. 
but it is not a break from working out your salvation. It is not a break from Jesus Christ. So it is in the present tense. We must be doing this today. But it is also an imperative. And many of you will know much better than I do on these grammatical terms. But an imperative is a command. Paul is not requesting or suggesting that you do this. No, he is commanding you to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. We must do it and we must not delay. But what does it look like? Practically, how do I work out my salvation? Well, I'll give you just two examples. First of all, you must set up your defences. What does that mean? It means you must resist the devil. You must confess your sin. You must lose that love that you have for the world. There is no room for that one sin. And this is a painful process. But this is a necessary process. You must set up your defences. And my friends, as I said before, that word work, it has the meaning of energy. This is going to require effort to work out your salvation. So you must set up your defences, but you must also press on. You must move forward. We need to progress from the spiritual milk and on to the spiritual meat. We need to move past the sins of our youth. And we must fight the good fight of faith. You must take up your cross and follow him daily. What is Christianity to you? Is it a status? Or is it a relationship? Well I pray it is the latter. And if it is then you and I must be actively involved in our Christian life. Fighting against the flesh. And moving on in our spiritual Disciplines, perhaps so that you're here today and you're on the outside. You're not yet a Christian. You're hearing all of this and maybe thinking, well that all sounds very unpleasant and a lot of work. Well Jesus never said it was going to be easy. But he did say it's going to be worth it. <coughs> if you want easy then you take the broad road. Many are going on that road. And that way leads to destruction. <coughs> but if you want Christ. Then take the narrow road. Only a few will venture on it. The way is hard. But their reward. Is eternal life. The Christian is to be obedient. The Christian is to be at work. And thirdly and finally the Christian is to be in awe. We are to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. What does that mean? Is, I thought fear of the Lord was just an Old Testament concept. Is it not only for Israel and the prophets? Well, this book of Philippians is rightly summarized as a book of spiritual joy. However, we absolutely can have the joy of the Lord and yet be working out our salvation with fear and trembling. The word for fear is phobos. I only tell you that because you can hear an English word in it. Phobia. When we say fear, it has the meaning of fright and terror and reverential awe. We must take God seriously. 
We must take God's word seriously. One commentator I read over this week had this line and I thought it very apt. Nobody giggles their way into salvation or spiritual maturity. The Christian must stand in awe of his maker. Knowing that his God is sovereign. Absolutely God is gracious and loving. That's the only reason we can stand here as Christians. Because God has done his part. He has worked in us. But God is just. In Proverbs 9 verse 10 it says. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of Wisdom. Yes, it's the beginning. But it is not something that you grow out of. It's not something you no longer require once you've been to the large table enough times. Instead, the individual here who has been in Christ the longest, whoever that is. Him or her and all of us must today stand in awe of God. Working out our salvation with fear. The fear of the Lord. Yes, it's the beginning of wisdom. It's the beginning. It's the middle. It's the end of the whole Christian life. But the second word is trembling. With fear and with trembling. And again, the original word, it relates to a tremor. Like an earthquake or literally shaking. We tremble as we work out our salvation. Because this is a serious matter. And yet some of us do not take it seriously. And that must change. We don't just come into our membership in the church. And take our seat at the Lord's table. And then do as we like. But we must work out our salvation with fear. And with trembling. For clarity, it is not a fear of losing your salvation or even of the final judgment because you, Christian, are assured of that. You are assured that you are in Christ. You are part of the family of God and all the privileges that that uh, entails. All God's children, all of you as Christians, your sin has been washed away by the blood of the Lamb. So don't misunderstand me. But it is a fear of displeasing God. It is a fear of causing others to stumble. It is a fear of incurring divine discipline. It is a fear and trembling of falling into sin. It is a fear of not taking God, not taking the cross, not taking our sin, not taking eternity seriously. It is a fear of what account I will give on the final day. Believer, after all Paul has said in this chapter, after explaining how Jesus Christ, and this is the context that Paul says these very serious words. We must remember that context of of verses 1 to 11. Of what Jesus Christ has supremely humbled himself in order to provide a way out of death and into life for you. And so we must work out our salvation with fear and trembling. But if you are not a Christian, remember you cannot work for your salvation. But our part is only possible because of God's part. We work out what he has already worked in. Have you called upon God's name Have you come confessing your sins? Have you turned away from the world? Have you surrendered your life to Jesus Christ? 
unless you be born again, you will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. If you have not received salvation, then I point you to Jesus Christ. And I'm going to read in conclusion just six verses to you. And this is so you will see your need of a saviour if you are here as an unbeliever. But also for the Christian that you would be reminded of what he has done so that you would resume working out your salvation. Philippians 2 verse 6. Who being in the very nature God. Do not consider equality with God something to be grasped. But made himself nothing. Taking the very nature of a servant. Being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man. He, Jesus humbled himself and became obedient to death even death on a cross therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let us work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Well, there is perhaps no greater psalm to sing for you to confess your love for Jesus Christ, for you to confess your sin and need of a saviour. And Psalm 23 in the Scottish Psalter on page 229, that you will be able to cry out, the Lord is my shepherd. I'll not want, he makes me down to lie. In pastures green he leadeth me, the quiet waters by. And that we'll be able to sing in exaltation at the end. Goodness and mercy all my life shall surely follow me. And in God's house forevermore my dwelling place shall be. Let us sing to the Lord. Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want He makes me Oh, 
mercy and peace from God the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit rest and abide in each one of us both now and forevermore.